the road to growth, success of an entrepreneur. We've raised the bar. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to growth with team lead of the Enriquez Group, Realtor Vinny. Hi, all you Road to Growth listeners. Uh, today I have Jeff Wilkinson. Uh, he is the founder of Keystone Bank. Now, I've had a lot of entrepreneurs on here, right? Building a business. Yet the idea of building a bank is, is something that just seems like on a different different level. But I know you you said that you're a, a serial entrepreneur. You've done a lot of things. I, I'm going to dive deeper into this and hopefully people listening get some great nuggets out of this. So thank you, Jeff, for being here. Thanks for having me, Benny. Uh, so tell me, this is your second bank that you've founded, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Does it get easier the second time? I think it did. Yeah. Uh, they're still hard, but, but certainly with 10 plus years of experience of doing the last one, that it, 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 cer- it certainly has helped me and our team get out of the gate quicker on this go round. So as a entrepreneur and you're gonna you have to walk walk us through your, your story as an entrepreneur did you i mean i'm assuming when you first started building businesses you were on the other side of the table asking for money yes i've done all of it uh you know the the, the first time through it um i guess really when you talk about building businesses i guess i've always just kind of been in, i've always felt like i've been in sales so um, I started out with CPA firms. I started growing practices for them where I was having to ask for the business day in and day out for people to sign up and expand into new geographies and territories and built some companies inside of a big bank in Kansas City. And I've always mostly done that through sales in my my perspective. So fast forward, I think all of the, you know, beating the street and, and wearing out the shoe leather in those endeavors, working for somebody else, you know, the first time that I decide that, hey, you know, I've seen these other people do this banking thing. Uh, I think I want to give that a try. I think I can do it. You know, it all came in really, really handy for me. Um, but but yeah, no, this when you when you when you launch into doing your own thing, you are asking. You need a lot of money to do what we do in the banking industry. It's a very capital intensive business. And so you are asking for capital a lot. Now, you, you talked about the idea of sales, building stuff. Where did that come from? Where did that mindset come from? Where your parents into sales? Do they have their own business or where did that mindset come from originally? I have no idea. Um, my dad was always very gregarious, uh, but I, 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 I don't know where the sales and marketing side of Jeff came from. Um, uh, nurture nature. I, I'm not sure you take your pick. Uh, the, uh, uh, I just, even when college, you know, people are like, what, you're going to go to work for an accounting firm. You should be in sales. So I guess it's just being, who I am, um, which is what I tell my people to today, just, just be you. Um, but it's what I love and it's what I'm good at. So I've always just, I've always stuck with that is, is what drives me and, and, and lean on, you know, like they say, what you're good at, stick to that. What was your, uh, what was your major in college? I was an accounting degree of all things. Okay. So, so I mean, when I picture an accountant, uh, of course you can't judge a book by its cover, right? (laughs) You picture someone introvert, you know, yeah. good with numbers. Right. Is that kind of how you were defined? Or were you more of an the outgoing personality when it comes to kind of sales? Or how did that mesh? I, I had an up, you know, in high school, I had an, a teacher that I liked and I took her accounting class because we had to pick a, an elective or whatever to get through high school. And I liked her. And so I just kind of went down that path. But yeah, no, I was in a fraternity in, in college and, and uh, you know, officer in my house and rush chairman one year, you know, I, I just have always just had a little bit different personality than most would think that an accounting quote unquote accounting person. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get hired at a college by someone who was more of a rainmaker type partner in a big CPA firm that had graduated from my college. So he kind of saw in me what sort of he had done with his career, which was heavy sales oriented, um, layered in with the technical. So for whatever reason, I kind of got accounting and could could understand the technical side of it. But I was always the you know the auditor getting in trouble for talking to the owner of the company and everybody else. Like we well, can't do that. It's like well, why not? He talked to me. So yeah, you're right. I'm not necessarily your typical accountant. 
Well, so talking about that first person that gave you the opportunity at the accounting firm, uh, did did you apply it at a bunch of places or was it strictly word of mouth or how did you come across that opportunity? The uh, Okay, so the accounting firms hire right when you get back to school your senior year. I think is the question you're asking is, how did I latch on to that accounting firm? Yeah, how did you latch, latch on to that one? Correct. It was purely because I'm sitting in a senior audit class at the beginning of the semester. We're, we're still in party mode in fraternity world. Um, and the head of the accounting department said, we need to get over and sign up for these accounting firm interviews. And that was the first that it even dawned on me as an accounting major that all of those jobs were interviewed for and hired in your first month and a half in school, your senior year. So he said, and, and, and I started to ask a question. He said, yes, you just need to get over and sign up, Jeff. Uh, see me after class. So I, he, I think he knew that I needed to go that direction. And I didn't even know that I needed to go to that direction. But he saw that in me. And then I went and interviewed with this accounting firm. And... The rest is history. Here we are, you and me talking today. It's crazy. All right. So you, you joined the accounting firm and you said the person you're under was more of a rainmaker. So he was kind of walked... okay. rainmaker, meaning I'm, you know, you're out interfacing with potential new clients. You're you're in sales, you're you're heavy sales, you know, customer acquisition, growth mode, grabbing on new clients, grabbing on revenue. Um, he had a lot of bank clients, which is how it all started for me. And he just started putting me on all of his accounting jobs that were community bank clients. And I've been working with community banks ever since. If you could look back at that person, I mean, in sales, right? I'm assuming right out the door, you weren't the greatest salesperson. I would assume. I could be totally wrong. No you way. <laughs> you no know what? No one ever is, right? You got to experience failure and all of the emotions to to be good at it and you're never really you can't ever stop trying to get better at it but what what did you when you started coming across failure right and coming across those motions of i could have closed that deal but i maybe i wasn't good enough or i didn't know how to do this or what drived you to keep pushing forward because some people kind of steer away from that stuff when those negative emotions start happening what what allowed you to kind of keep pushing forward lots of things I think it was coming, part of it was coming to the realization that you need to know what you're trying to sell and you need to make sure that you're in a position to make sure that you're, you've got somebody on the other end that isn't just, that they're making part of the decision to buy you as part of the process and buy from you and with you as part of the process. I think too often in sales, we're worried about moving a widget and if you don't buy it, you know, then you are wrong. And I think there, there has to be that relationship aspect of the sales process. So for me, it became uh, it became clear that you, you have to, it has to be a two-way street. You don't want people that just want to be there just because you got the cheaper price. Uh, you want them to have invested in the process with you. Those are the best long-term clients. So I think learning that through sales is really comes with just a lot of, uh, a lot of failure and a lot of realizing, oops, boy, I missed that. I, I, I wished I would have done that a little differently. I wished I would have taken a little more time. Um, I wish I would have had one more meeting or one more call. So I think you just learn over time the process by sticking to who you are and what you know. And this is what I have to offer. And we'd love to have you. And hopefully you choose me over the next guys. But here's what I can provide. And making sure you're not, you know, you sometimes it's hard. You want to win everything, right? Yeah. But then on the other hand, you really don't want to win everything. Because not everybody's going to be a great client. So you got to go take your swings. And I don't know where people learn it, but you just got to get up to the plate and you just got to keep getting up to the plate. And 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 calling, cold calling and re, you know, reaching out to people, you know, doing it honestly, you know, persevering. And, you know, if it's 530 on Friday, I always found that was Fridays was when I was tired, right? About midday, you're like, man, maybe I just need to knock it off and start fresh next week. And I always plowed through it. And I always called up until 5, 530. And I could look back on my lifetime and realize I probably sold and moved the ball forward more 
from 4.30 to 5.30 on Friday than any other period of time of the day or any day of the week. And I think you just got to plow through it. And that's when people are returning. That's when CEOs are sitting in their office and they're kind of tired too, kicking back a little bit. Everybody's kind of gone home and they're more inclined to have a conversation with you. So, and I, I, there were many, many days when I wanted to just say, you know, I'm just going to do this next week. And I always told myself, just keep calling. What, what, what drives, what drives you in those situations? Cause I mean, I know a lot of different people, it's either the, the fear of failure or basically looking towards those success, those wins, the, the past successes. I mean, in those moments, what was driving you to keep calling for those? Next I bet months? it was fear of failure to be honest with you. I bet. I mean, I looking back, I, that's more than likely what it was. It was like, I don't want to let these people down that, you know, have put me in this position and I'm not, I haven't sold anything this quarter or this month. And, I don't want them to lose faith in me. And I think we got a good product. I just got to get in front of enough people that'll, you know, listen to me, but it was probably fear of failure. Now you're, letting people down. You're in that position uh, at the CPA. How long were you with that company for? Uh, first one for two years and the second one for seven years. Okay. So about nine now, years total. Would you remember your call why you left the first company to go to the, the second one? Yeah, I wanted a little more. I wanted a little smaller environment, number one. And number two, uh, a couple of the individuals that I had worked with at the bigger firm had left to go to work for the smaller firm. And the smaller firm specialized in banking, whereas the bigger firm, it was one day it was a bus company and the next day it was a food company. And I was just excited to go with these guys I liked over to this smaller firm that vocal, you know, specialized in banking. It seemed interesting to me. Now you're with that second company for seven years. Yes. Was that when you transitioned over to starting your own business? Well, I guess kind of did because we started at Denver. We, the company was based in Kansas city and they moved me to Denver to start a practice for them in Denver, uh, oh. target rich bank environment. And then after I did that for a few years and they transferred me to Iowa to again, very target rich environment to expand and open a practice to, to sell. So I was, so I was growing practices for those, for those accounting firms. So, what what was your routine like when you're when you're growing a business in an area that you're not too familiar with? Boy, everywhere's different, isn't it? <laughs> Probably be different where you're at. Was I, it hiring the right people? Being was it taking the the, the bull by its horn and prospecting yourself and kind of getting prospecting myself? I mean, if you can't sell yourself, there's no reason to go bring a bunch of people with you. It really was early on. It was just boots on the street. You know, there was just a few of you and you had to make sure that the work that you did get hired to do, you had to do super, super well. You, you couldn't, you couldn't mess the work, the delivery of the work up. And cause that's where your referrals were going to come from. And then you just literally had to get out and do everything you could to meet as many people as you can to tell your story. It's, it's Part, part of it's hard because nobody knows who you are, but part of that makes it actually pretty easy because generally people are intrigued by somebody new. And mm. oh, what, what do you have to offer that the same people I've known for 20 years? So in the one hand, it's hard, but on the other, sometimes people want to, they want to hear the new guy on the block. It's, it's double-edged sword and go you, both ways. Do you recall like any kind of a, uh of your, your sales pitches to, to get in front of the people? I, um, I have, listen, I have tried, I think everything that you can possibly try except lying to people to get, you know, in front, in front of them. I, I think if you could say I was on the phone with so-and-so and they suggest they, they mentioned, Hey, do you know, so-and-so, I mean, that whole association marketing is a really, really smart angle for me. Um, or, Hey, I ran into, so, you know, I saw you love to stop in and meet with you, you know, some sort of association acknowledgement, uh, and, uh, don't give yourself away. I mean, that's the, that's the death nail. Don't give yourself away and don't get boxed into the conversation. Make sure that you're doing at least some intelligence to find out who the decision maker is. You're either going to get to the decision maker. Your goal is to get to the decision maker, the top person. You may not start there always, or but you always have to make sure they know that you're around. 
one way or another. And that the people that you're talking with know that they know you're around. So mm -hmm. I, you got to do a some intelligence. You can't just send a blanket. I'd like to meet you. I think you and I probably both get those about 12 times a day inside of our junk <laughs> mailboxes. And you're like, and, and that doesn't, I can't, I can't get excited about that. I can get excited about somebody's taking the time to call me though, personalize a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a great idea. Bringing the association of at least that they did a little research before they called you instead of just uh strictly cold and it makes it going, well, I've got, like you said, 12 different emails, yeah. five different text messages, a couple. Isn't that emails. annoying? <laughs> it really is. And I feel sorry for it because how else, I mean, you got to try, like I said, I, like we've talked about before, I've tried just about everything. Uh, hopefully everybody else that's calling on you and I, or they've tried just about everything. Uh, but you got to do what works best for you and just be yourself. I, if people see that you're trying to be yourself and not trying to give yourself away and, you know, be a quality option in the market, I think you'll, you'll do well. Now, okay. You built the business. You helped expand this company right here. Now, what happened next after those seven years there, where did you transition to next? Oh gosh, man, we could, I, I, I could tell you this, without going into the gory details of my life, yeah. um, I've always been around community banking. Mm. Uh, I, I, you know, even when I was working in the community bank consulting world, you know, it was for community banks. So I was with another large consulting company that worked, had a, had a very large banking practice. I've worked for a very large publicly traded bank and built a couple of companies inside of that publicly traded bank and spun it out. Um, target markets of both of those companies were community banks. Um, so I've always been a community bank fan and I've always been exposed to community banking. Kind of brings me up to when I got to Texas in 2005, I got recruited to be the CFO of a publicly traded community bank down here in Texas. I made the move. Um, we sold it about a year and a half after I got here. It's the right thing to do. Um, it was a great experience and it kind of set me up. It's kind of a capstone, if you will, of my my undergrad to, to, uh, to really launch into my master's with the start of my first bank uh, down here in Texas, which, which we start, started in 2007. And then I exited in 16 and then started this one that we've got now, which is Keystone Bank here in Austin, Texas, that we opened the doors in October of 2018. So there's a lot. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot to fill in in there, but just remember that the interesting thing about me is that I've always been around community banking. With, with uh, where you got the opportunity, right, for that company that was sold, uh, yeah. you were there for a year and a half? I was, yeah. Was that through networking, strictly networking? It was. Really? It was. Really and truly, it was. Uh, when I started with the big accounting firm in Kansas City out of college, I met a guy. I met two people that I worked with uh, who ended up getting married. And one of them had to leave the firm. My friend left the firm, but his wife stayed with and ultimately ended up being a partner in that firm running their uh, Texas banking practice out of Houston. And when she got to Texas back in 04, one of her clients was this, was this customer and, and, and she, she had, you know, they had confided in her, the board and the, the CEO that they were likely to move in a different direction in terms of bringing in another, a different kind of CFO than when the one they had. And, she was racking her brain going, I wish I could think of somebody. I haven't been in Texas long. And her husband says, well, call Wilkinson. Uh, I remember getting the call at dinner and my wife and Debbie asked me, my friend's wife, who's the partner. She says, what do you think about coming to Texas? And then my wife wanted to know what's she talking about? You know, we're living in my wife's hometown of St. Louis, right? You don't ever get somebody out of St. Louis a woman once she's back home. But, um, my wife goes, tell her we don't and that we're eating. <laughs> uh, so anyways, that's how it happened. And, and she said, we well, at least have to meet the CEO. You guys really hit it off. And we did. We talked for about six months. Took took quite a long time for me to get comfortable to move my family across the country yet again. And, but we did it and it, it was a great move. And and it was a quick burn on that company, but it, it was the right thing to do. And so 
Uh, yeah. It was networking, so, right? Good old fashioned networking. I'd have so never you, known about that job if it weren't for, 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 for Debbie and that being one of her clients. You, you brought it up before that it's always good to talk to the decision maker and make sure you're talking to the decision maker. Yes. So how did they sell your wife on making the transition from saying? I don't know. I just remember we were. I I don't I don't I I don't know. I I think my wife finally got to the point. She was like, I don't really want to move the family again. Um, we were out of we you know I think we were out of town with a bunch of our friends from our church, whose all of our kids were at church camp, and so we were down and picking them up, and we all stayed the long weekend and. We all prayed on it all weekend long, and I think that helped. I, I don't really know. I think she just got to meet him through the process, and his wife. Okay. You know, when they flew us down, and um, they what? You know, his daughter watched my youngest, my oldest now, my only child, or my second, my first child. She he she babysat while we went to dinner, and I I, I don't know that it, he ever convinced her, uh, but we ultimately you know prayed on it a lot and decided that we would do that. It was funny. I remember my wife asking me, she goes, are you sure you could do it? <laughs> <laughs> I'd never been a CFO of a public company before, but I thought I could, I thought I could pull it off. Um, but uh, it was a great move for us. We, we, we loved every minute. We've loved every minute of it. It was a short burn, but then that led me to, to the creation of my first bank in Texas called Pioneer Bank. Uh, and then it's just led, you know, it's just led us to where we're at today. Now, sitting in Keystone Bank Studios in downtown Austin, Texas, on air with Vinny. <laughs> yeah. With so you're you've had so many over the years since college, right? Networking with community banks, right? Then you got yep. that opportunity to be the CFO yep. and then starting your own actual bank, right? Yes, sir. How do you figure out that blueprint of kind of putting it together? Was it I'm going to pick and choose with the people that, because it sounded like for a lot of the, the, the places that you were a part of, they saw talent in you. And so they brought you over to help you build, help, help them build basically a good bank. Is yes. that how you looked at it when you built your bank or what was that process looking like when you put that blueprint together? I want to build it. Yeah. So, okay. So we're all informed by our past. So when I was a bank consultant, I actually, one of the things our firm did was help people start banks. And I was exposed to that process and with three different investor groups around the country, you know, one in Nebraska, one in Missouri, and, and one in Colorado that had been clients of the firm and had sold their bank and then were going to come back in and start another bank. So I actually got involved in that, learning that process as a consultant, something that I was fascinated with. And so I had a little, I had, I had a lot more insight to things than your average person does. I always thought it would be cool. Um, and then I saw that it could be done because I help people do it. So yeah. I had a glimpse of the kind of the, the the legal side of what it takes and the regulatory side of what it takes. And so in 2006, when my last company sold, I heard about a Dallas banker and an Austin uh, real estate developer who had an idea to seed uh, uh, the start uh, and launch of a bank in, just outside Austin. So I was so as part of that acquisition of my last company, I was not going forward with the acquirer or, you know, they cut people like me. Um, and so I reached out to them cause I didn't want to move and it was near my home where I lived. Uh, and so anyway, I just reached out to them and said, I'd be interested in joining up with you guys. So that's how I, that's how I launched into the start of the first bank was I met a couple of people that had an early idea uh, that they, they wanted to start a bank. And so, so we met and we talked and finally we agreed that I would join to be the leader to build the company. Um, and uh, we, we set out and did that, opened the doors in May of 07. Arguably a really bad time, yeah. but arguably really the best time because it was right before the collapse of the recession in 08, which was a wonderful time for community banks across the country. So the, the the first bank that you put together, you you heard basically of a, a um, two individuals looking to build something. That's right. Did, did you have any kind of networking connection with them, or was it simply a friend of a friend, or just you? I heard someone in the town was doing it. Uh, it was an article in, in the Austin Business Journal, and uh, I had no idea who the Austin real estate person was. I I didn't know who the Dallas banker was, but being in the banking industry, we all kind of are. We're all it's a pretty networking 
easy environment. So I just looked him up in the bank directory and just lobbed a call into him. Um, I had no idea how to get a hold of the. They don't have similar things like that in the real estate industry. Um, I just called the banker and just said, you know, if they were looking for somebody to be their leader. And so I said, you know, I, you wouldn't find me because I'm coming out of a bank that's being acquired um, and I'm new to town. And uh, so anyway, that just left that voicemail. And then I heard from him 15 minutes later and the rest is history. We were off and running at that point, as I say. And I, and I had money too. I had some money, which was nice. That was helpful. Uh, from the exit of the sell of the public company that I was, had just been the CFO for. So that was helpful too. It, it's, it seems multiple times through, through this conversation, you've been okay with, with asking for the business, asking yes. for the, the job, asking position. Yep. I mean, do you ever, ever worry about the idea of rejection or what are they going to think, failure? Uh, why sh I mean, why did I make that phone call? I mean, does that ever come across your mind at all? Yeah, but it doesn't, but it doesn't stop me. I don't, yeah. best compliment I ever got was from a private equity guy in Kansas City. And he said, you know, the thing with Jeff is, is you can tell him to go, <laughs> you know what, up a rope. And then it, all he hears is call me Tuesday. <laughs> I, I don't know where it comes from. I guess a, 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 a genuine fear of failure or something. But no, I, I, I just, I think I have a lot to offer. Do you, I mean, in those moments of, of getting the rejection or maybe they say, oh, I don't want to do it or whatever it might be, do you have a, an avenue that you release maybe the frustration or how do you overcome those, those ideas or those moments of, hey, I, I should have done that or maybe that wasn't really the right decision? I mean, is there a process you go through? I start from the very, very beginning, which is I have to convince these people that, that they have to make a decision to buy something for me. This is not a one-way street. This is not them making the decision. And all I'm doing is putting something on the plate and then they can like it or not. And then I'm irrelevant. So as long as I make sure that I approach it, that I am relevant and that I've got something to offer along with the sale of the banking service or whatever it might be, then I feel pretty darn good. I feel like I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to go win more than my fair share of the business. And you're not going to win every one of them. The only thing I can tell you is that if you approach it from that way, you're going to get the lion's share of the business that you deserve with clients that are going to be really great clients of yours for a very long period of time. And so it's almost like that deal you don't do is almost better than the, the bad deal that you did do, right? Sometimes it's better to let things go. So I approach it from that. I try to process on it that way. I don't, I fight like heck, but if I don't get something, maybe it just wasn't meant to be. And that's okay. Cause not everything, as long as you gave it your all and you didn't cut corners and you didn't give yourself away and you stuck true to who you are, then I think that's where you got to get your comfort. Cause not everyone's going to be a customer. You can't have everyone. So at the end of it, if it does go in a negative way, you did everything you could. It's just a simple idea of I did everything I could in that process on to the yeah. next one. And they're just not going to pick you. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, if you didn't do your job, if you short circuited yeah. and you got lazy or, you know, you didn't really do your best then you ought to be kicking yourself for that. If you lost a good one, you ought to be kicking yourself for that. I don't know that there's any cure for that other than don't do it again. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's my that's my yeah. mentality. Uh, everybody's got their own mentality, but I do think I have a lot to offer. So, I think you have to believe that you have a lot to offer, also, as the representative of what you're selling. What do you think has been? And we've kind of talked about it before we got on, on mic about putting stuff out there, either on social media or other platforms, and kind of the kickback you might get. I mean, is that one of the biggest, I guess, issues that you work through as? running a bank or what are, what are some of the bigger things that you have to kind of focus on, on a, a daily, monthly, I mean, I guess yearly basis. Well, people let's, let's, let's step through it. Our people, it, it's incredible. Uh, the difference that you can achieve quickly by only associating yourself with the people that are 100% behind what you're doing. Uh, we call it hiring for fit and not for need. You know, I've heard it called lots of different things, but 
if you've got a job that you've got to fill that is a critical role and you're down to the last three candidates and there isn't a consensus among the group of people that are hiring that there is not an all-star in the three of them, then you need to be prepared to start over no matter how critical the position is that you need to fill. And that's how I would describe it. You have got to hire for fit. And if you don't, that means you don't care about the other people that you have there that, that are already work there. And if you care about the rest of the people that are already there, then you're going to hire for fit every time and not for need. Cause the last thing you want is a, a wrong hire in there because they cause havoc. How many people in your hiring process does someone have to go through? How many different interviews? I mean, is it? It's, uh, it varies. It varies. Uh, we, we, you know, I'd love to hire everybody if I could, but it's just not possible at this stage of the game. I love meeting everybody and, and it's even still not possible. I love to know. I, I like to get brought in just so I can sort of get a glimpse of the person, but more importantly, just impart on them what it takes to be successful in our environment. But, you know, we have, we had a, we have a president, we have a head of HR now and we have hiring managers. And so, you know, I would say, you know, a minimum of two interviews uh, and a minimum of probably three people at this stage you're going to be interviewing with. With all the knowledge you've accumulated over the years, do you, what, what piece of advice would you give to your college self? That one that just got his first job in the sales position. I mean, what kind of advice do you think you'd give that person? You hustle is free. I think somebody's probably written a book about it. I'm not, a, you know, I'm sure somebody's already used that yeah. phrase. So if I'm stealing it from somebody else, I apologize. But it is you hard work is free. No one's charging you for it. No one's making you pay for it. It is all up to you. You know, define what that is uh, and make yourself available. All of you make yourself available. Be real. Be who you are. Be real. Make yourself available, you know, and just just get out there and grind, grind, grind. Hustle, hustle, hustle. There is no other way to do it. You don't need money to do that. That's my advice. I think a lot of people go, well, I can't, there's nothing that I can think of that I could do because I don't have enough money. And that is wrong. There's so, I, I mean, I'm a bank. I see entrepreneurs <laughs> all day long of all shapes and sizes and every one of them started out with nothing. There's very few people that I bank and that I see that started with a golden spoon in their mouth. Where do you see from the, let's say from all the different entrepreneurs that you see, right? What would you say? How would you define someone's on the right track? Someone that maybe is not on the right track. Is there a common denominator that, that you see when, oh, okay, this person looks like they have something. This person, probably someone I, our company should probably invest in. I mean, how do you look at that? Yeah. Uh, we look at past successes, right? So we look at how, uh, we look, we look at, we look at how hard are they selling me on what they want to do. They, they, I have to be sold on it. I have to make sure that they believe in it and that there's that there's a reasonable chance that they're going to be successful in this endeavor because of prior experiences or because of, you know, the model that they've sort of come up with. So I have to hear that. I have to hear the passion, but I also have to hear. I also have to see a lot of listening, and I also have to see a lot of willingness to say, "Wait a minute." One of the keys to my success as an entrepreneur is to find a great banker. So I, I'm looking for that. Are they really wanting a great banker and a great bank? Or are they just wanting a transaction? So I'm looking at that really, really hard. Um, you know, do they respect banking in general? You know, financial, you know, do they, uh, you know, do they seek out, you know, that information? Do they seek out help? Do they seek out the best partner? You know, are they interested in what the bank has to say? Or are they just there to tell the bank, no, you're a commodity. It's the same everywhere else. And I'm going to, I'm, this is what I'm doing. You need to do this for me or I'm going to go down the road. And when I hear that, then I let them walk down the road and I refocus my energy on the people that don't say that. And they're saying, tell me a little bit about how you've helped other entrepreneurs. What are some of the other kind of entrepreneurs that you've helped out in the marketplace? Um, what, 
you know, and, and I've just, there is a distinguishment in this world between community banks and everybody else providing in the financial sector, in my opinion. Um, what do you see that difference to be? I think we, I think we've just been trained as an industry to know how to deal with all kinds of people without giving the farm away and without being that commodity. Here's your lowest rate. Give me all your cash to get this lowest rate. And then all of a sudden you, you're stuck because you, you, you took the low rate instead of the best rate. So um, I don't know. I think community bankers are genuinely trained to do what's right all the time for their customer, even if it means saying no right now. So I think that's key. What you said right there with anyone's that's listening right here that basically take the, the low rate compared to the best rate, take the, the low product compared to the best product. I mean, and anyone that's listening right now, I think that's such a key thing to take away right there. I, it's, I live it by, I live a die by it. I, I tell my people every day, we are, we are not a commodity uh, just because 10 other banks down the road are doing something. You know, that's another key that I'm look for. When you ask me, what am I looking for? You know, when I get somebody that is in front of me trying to convince me that they need a bank to do this for them. And then they, and then I tell them, well, here's kind of, I try to get to the meat of the argument quickly. I try to tell them if I if I like this deal, I can fight for it. And here's kind of how I think it looks. You know, I'm trying to get to that quickly. Most banks don't. They want to ask you for three months. Or, you know, take three months and ask you for every piece of paper that you've got. Only get to the final conversation, which is there's no match. Mm-hmm. So I try to get that to pretty quickly. But when I hear people go, "Oh, well, did you know that the bank down the road will do this and this other bank?" and then I just like, "No, I don't. I don't really care because." <laughs> They, you know, and I really don't want to come across as Eric because when I say I don't care, I've got all I can say grace over right now. I I can't worry about what you think somebody else down the road is doing because we're trying to have a conversation about what you need and what I can do and how do we get match up on that. That's the only thing that I can focus on. So just because somebody down the road does it one way doesn't mean that that's how we do it. And so I want to get to the conversation quickly with you about how we do it. I want speed there. That's what you should want as an entrepreneur is no nonsense from your banker. Speed in the conversation, getting to the heart of the matter quickly. Do we have a match or not? And if so, let's get it done. And if not, let's help introduce you to some other bankers that maybe it fits better for them right now. How how often do you assess what other community banks are doing to see if you need to change any practices or all the time, okay. all the time? Yeah, we 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 really do. When I say I don't care, no, we care. Don't get me wrong. We would be stupid if we didn't care. I'm just saying in the sales process, yeah. what somebody else is doing isn't relevant to what I think you need to be doing and what we would do for you. So that's two different. But we're yeah. constantly assessing the marketplace. We see it uh, from our good clients who are getting called on and somebody's selling based on rate. And then they say, Did you, I got this deal from this credit union that's got this lowest rate. I can't even, it's almost free. And you're like, just thought I'd let you know. So we, we have, we have our ears, we have our ears open. Um, we talk to bankers all the time. You know, we have peers out there that we talk to, how are you guys doing this? How are you doing that? What kind of market are you seeing? What kind of competition are you seeing? We hear it all the time. You know, when, when you're in the middle of sales and you're giving money away. It, you you tend to hear who's got the cheapest money, and why we should be doing the same thing. And so, yeah, we're constantly paying attention to what other people are doing or not doing. Uh, and then, yeah. go ahead. No, no, please, 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 please. Well, I just think we have to model off of that, off off of what we want to do first, right? And what's good yeah. for us, and then you know, hopefully, what's great for the majority of the people out there that meet our client profile, which is founders and entrepreneurs and business owners and executives. Jeff, I, I appreciate you being here, giving all the, the great. You got it. I enjoyed it. Got some. Lot. One last last question yep. is: If let's say we're talking in five years from now, right? Where do you envision yourself and your company being? Man, I hope people in Austin, Texas, are still staying. I just I love your spirit that you have at Keystone Bank. I mean, that's that would mean everything to me. Mm. Uh, you know, hopefully we're still fiercely independent, uh, and we're still just slaying it for the entrepreneurs and founders and business owners and executives and professionals and 
their families and their friends and their communities in and around Austin, Texas. I, I just hope people are still saying, but we love your, we love that. We love the feel of your company. Uh, and the spirit is awesome. That would mean everything to me. Well, perfect. Well, thank you, Jeff, for being here. If anyone listening right now needs a good community bank that, I mean, is the best way for the website to go to your, oh, yeah, keystone.bank. Okay. Perfect. Yep. And it's in the show notes. So please reach out, reach out to Jeff, reach out to one of Jeff's employees, reach out to one of Jeff's team members. Uh, thank you guys for being here. Thank you, Jeff, for, for walking us through your story. Please subscribe, please share and tell your friends. Come see us next time you're in Austin, Vinny. Can't wait. See you. All right. Thanks Bye. for having me. Bye-bye. Thank you.